Americans are some of the most generous and compassionate people on the planet. Find out what this award-winning author's work with refugees and the poor can teach us about the roots of compassion, next on Living Smart. Hello, I'm Patricia Grass. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Today's guest, a winner of the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights, shares how compassion and philanthropy can revitalize low-income communities. As a society, what is the best way to help people with addictions, unlawful behaviors, and homelessness transition into the mainstream? Barbara Elliott will tell us what works. Where are you working starting Monday? Starting Monday, I'm working at RKI Incorporated. Okay. All right. Each time a graduate lands a job, everyone at the Working Connection celebrates. Congratulations. It feels real good. The Working Connection is a program that we introduced here in Houston to essentially take people who are in transition and to move them from whatever their past was, homelessness, prison, welfare, getting fired from a whole lot of jobs in a row, and to move them into a position where they know how to apply for a job well, how to present themselves well in an interview, and then link them to employers who can, who can actually who will give them a chance. Here we've been through the open door and Star of Hope and stuff, and we changed our lives around. So this is about second chances to a large extent. The program models itself after Cincinnati Works. Elliot found that 83% of those who took the course were still employed after a year. They learn what each other... Sandy Schultz is the executive director. The model works because of the relationship that gets established with the people that come through the program. But much more importantly than that is the follow-up that's going to occur in the year following that to help um, stay with them. It's going to pay back off for them. So in the course of a week, these at-risk students learn how to get a job. But the relationships they form can remain for a lifetime. They need somebody to believe in them that they really can have a different life. 230 are expected to graduate this year. We've got an update on where everybody is. So here's one. We've got a truck driver coming mm -hmm. through. And let's see. He is um, he's at Lowe's. Mm -hmm. Elliot chose community partners, such as homeless shelters and community service organizations. Sylvia Bowling, who serves on her board, runs the Alden Youth Center. For 17 years, my nose has been to the grindstone. I've been in all, all kind of houses. I've been on the corner with the gang members. I've seen tears. I've seen everything. So if people are going to serve low-income people, you must know the people you serve. Elliot features Sylvia Bowling in her second book, Street Saints, Renewing America's Cities. She started researching the book in 1995 when she came back to the United States from Germany, where she had worked as a PBS correspondent. There are people who are um, candles, in a sense, in, in dark and troubled places in our inner cities. And I went out onto the streets to meet them. I have been in the last years, I have probably been in more homeless shelters and prisons and inner city schools than I ever had in my life before. Her experience covering Europe had set her on a path to understand those in need. It also renewed her faith. I'd say I'd had a, a child's faith um, with a sense of the beauty and the goodness of God. I could hear his voice in the music of Bach, but it was really later in life. I had an awakening in uh, 1987. At that point in my life, I had done a lot of things that the world said was important. She walked us through those glamorous chapters of her life. I had a, a Washington chapter, as you know, when I got to work in the White House with President Reagan. So here he is with a very young-looking George Bush. And I had a second political chapter in my life later um, involving George Bush. So he uh, very kindly gave me the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights. And uh, the earlier part of my life that was in Germany led to this book, Candles Behind the Wall. Um, and I actually have a, a piece of the Berlin Wall here. Elliot had reported the fall of the Berlin Wall and then covered what she thought was the biggest story of the century. I missed what took place leading up to the fall of the Berlin Wall in one respect, and that is that there was a moral and a spiritual revolution that was taking place before the political one, and that that was largely unreported at the time. 
What had happened in Poland when John Paul II went there in 1979 was a seismic occurrence. It set off this cycle of things. There were people in East Germany and in Hungary and Romania and Czechoslovakia, all of whom had similar, conv similar convictions, who, because of their faith, had the courage to stand and to say, not only this regime must end, but to say, we will resist it peacefully. That had never happened in the entire history of the world. Nearly 400 million people were freed, and scarcely a shot was fired. She launched a private initiative to assist refugees fleeing communist countries in 1989. It was then she wrote her first book, Candles Behind the Wall. What the world says is important. Political power, money, prestige, image, all of those things. Is that important, or is the kind of soul that you have important? That was my crisis, my turning point. It was a change of heart. And once I had that change of heart, I began to lead a different kind of a life. Hey, man. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, God bless you. I am so glad to see you. Since then, Barbara spends her life trying to improve other people's lives. These men at the homeless shelter have all graduated from the Working Connection and all have found jobs. Curtis Irvin found what he calls his dream job, after his prison release. I didn't have no employment, I didn't have any, uh, no skills. I wanted to be a professional truck driver. And he succeeded. I've been in school at the Houston Community College oh, for, for seven weeks. That's right. And last Friday, uh -huh. I successfully graduated and completed. Oh, that is amazing, yeah. that is so great. Oh, admire. Today is graduation day at the Working Connection. It's the largest class since it was founded and Barbara is giving the commencement speech. I look at you today and I see that you are not just the product of your past. You're somebody who is starting as of tomorrow on a new life. You are no longer the captive of whatever kinds of mistakes you've made in your past. You are a person of hope. And today's graduation celebrates second chances <laughs> as this man prepares for a new job. Thank you so much, Barford, for joining us. We really appreciate it. You know, you started out in the White House, and then you were a correspondent in Europe. How did you end up working with homeless people and former criminals? You know, I've asked myself that same <laughs> question a few times. It's a very different kind of a life. Um, I just reached a point where I really had to ask, you know, I've done all this stuff that the world says is important, and I'm nobbing with European aristocrats and going off for, you know, luxurious European vacations. But in the end, none of it has any lasting value. And when I finally really honestly asked the question, what should I do, <clears throat> the answer was a very surprising one. It was refugees. And I kind of, you know, looked up at the answer of this prayer and said, I don't really know how to do that. But it was right at the time that the Berlin Wall was about to come down. And there had been suddenly 300,000 people who had been let loose, basically, from Eastern Europe who were crossing into Western Europe, right. which is where I was living. And it was just very clear that it was too many for the Red Cross, it was too many for the government. So with one friend, I launched a small private initiative just to go to those that we could scoop up right around Cologne, which is where mm -hmm. I was living. Mm -hmm. So we took them clothes and pots and pans and food. We tutored their kids, we helped them find jobs, we listened to them mm -hmm. and loved them through the transition. Right. And it was such a remarkable thing that helped me First of all, understand the joy of giving to people and just loving them through the place to get them on their feet. But the second thing was <clears throat> that I began to understand communism from the perspective of people who'd actually lived in it. Mm -hmm. And I'd reported about it. I'd stood right. at the Berlin Wall with my microphone in hand and <clears throat> gesticulated to the world. But what I didn't understand was really what it looked like in the lives of the people who were there. And from that, experience with them grew the opportunity to go back to the countries that they had fled from, to Poland and to Hungary and to East uh, Germany and then later to Russia, and to find the people who had been really these spark plugs of change because of their faith bringing about a change in regime. Um, the candles, uh, a bit of candles behind the wall, that was the, what, the fruit of that, but what happened after that was an opportunity then to speak in the countries whose stories I had compiled. Right and to then help the people who were renewing on the grassroots 
of those countries were in the ashes of the collapsed empire. There were people who were rebuilding, and they were putting together radio stations and schools and hospitals, and they needed medicine. They needed contacts in the West. They needed help. Right. And in a remarkable way, I got to be that little bridge to them. And we'll, we'll talk later about how you can become smartly compassionate, but how did you transition from all that to to the streets of America, to working with people in America? I came back to the United States in 1995, and with the same determination to try to do what I was created to do, um, once again I prayed, only this time the answer was go in the inner city. And I kind of looked up and said, I don't know the inner city, you know, this mm. is not really my world. But it was very clear that there were people of courage and integrity, like some of the Eastern Europeans that I'd found, mm -hmm. but who were working in America, taking broken lives and making them whole. Mm -hmm. And I went on a real mission to seek them out and to, initially I had been in a part of an organization that was giving awards. And I concluded after doing that, awards are great, giving them money is great, but what they really needed were people to come alongside them, get into the trenches with them, mm -hmm. and make what they do better, stronger, and more focused, and I, in a sense, became their advocate, the person who wrote about them, and then who came alongside with my own efforts to, to increase what they were doing. So once you met them, that's how you helped them? What I did once I met them was, first of all, ask them, what do you need? You know, a lot of, I'll say, misguided good intentions would be simply to go and say, this is what you need to do, and let me solve all your problems for you. Well, I knew full well that Sylvia Bowling in Aldine knows exactly what the people in Aldine know because she has street credibility because right. she lives there. Right. I know that guys like Prince Cousinart and Rufus Smith in the Third Ward know exactly what needs to happen there. I don't have that experience, but they do. So my job was to say to them, what do you need? Of course, everybody said money, and I don't have $100 million <laughs> to give away. I wish I did. I want money, too. <laughs> okay. But what, what I was able to do is say, what do you need in terms of people in the community who can help you do what you do? Do you need volunteers? What do you have on your board? What kind of programs are you working? Can you track your results? Do you have people who can help you write proposals? Do you have any visibility? So what grew out of that was an opportunity to do training seminars for them through the Center for Renewal, which is the group that I started here in Houston, and then later to serve as their advocate in other places. The Philanthropy Roundtable allowed me to speak at a number of their, their gatherings around the country to philanthropists. Uh, the Bush administration began the faith-based initiative, and I was a part of that in forming the Compassion Capital Fund. I was a part of evaluating the first $30 million of grants that they were able to give to faith-based groups and then be this bridge between the different worlds of the folks on the street, the folks in the media, the folks in the boardroom, and also those in Washington to help it grow in a way that respects the integrity of the people doing the work and makes them strong. You're an author of two books and you're an award winner. Do you see yourself more of, as an author or as someone who's a compassion worker? You know, I've done cycles of both. I think primarily I am a writer, but what I write about grows out of experience. Mm -hmm. I've had two cycles now, complete cycles, where I've done the hands-on, being out in the trenches with the Eastern Europeans who were coming to the West, and then learning about them, and then writing about the experience, digging in and doing the research. And then the third part of the cycle is when the book is out then speaking and exhorting right, right. and encouraging others to come alongside them. I've done the same cycle now that I've been back in the States with the, the kind of hands-on work in the inner city. I've been able to dig in and do the research and to speak at a whole lot of conferences. Uh, Street Saints w was the result of the, the second round. Right. That was two and a half years ago the book came out, and I'm still speaking. Uh, universities, churches, right. um, government offices, uh, philanthropic organizations, right. and to simply encourage people now to go and to do the things that work. So I'm planting right, models right. now. You want to be effective. What are you planning now? What I'm planting right now is actually what I'm, what I'm doing is come out of the research. I found that a couple of the examples that really worked were the Working Connection, and we just saw some, mm -hmm. some of the stories there. And another one is Kids Hope USA. I am absolutely convinced that mentoring young children is one of the most effective things that we can do to early enough intervene in a way that it changes lives. If you can reach at-risk children when they are six and seven years old, it'll totally change the rest mm -hmm. of their life. 
So I've been deliberately planting partnerships all over Houston and elsewhere throughout the country to, to mobilize people of goodwill who can go in one-on-one -on -one into the public schools and take care of these kids who really are in need. It changes lives. And don't you have a lot of retirees doing that, which is a great thing for a retired you person? You know, it is, although we thought initially that that would be primarily the folks who'd be most engaged, but we're finding people in right in the middle of their professional life find that they have one hour a week, and sometimes it's the most valuable hour. I could be flying around the world speaking and writing and whatever, but that one hour a week that I go to see Jessica, Makes a big I know difference. matters to her. Right. Now, what are some of the most impressive people that you have met in, in all this research that you've done all these years? You've Gosh. met some incredible people. I have met some incredible people. A um, couple of them that come to mind. Cordelia Taylor is just an amazing woman that I met in Milwaukee. Um, she is somebody who grew up in poverty, African-American woman who was very angry. Uh, but she reached a point in her life when she had succeeded, gotten a nursing degree, and she went back into the neighborhood that she had left in Milwaukee, moved in among crackheads, gangs warring with each other, and started something called Family House. She event eventually had two houses, then three, and she invited in people who were in the later days of their life, who were living in poverty, and maybe they had uh, Alzheimer's, and they could safely live there. Now, she went out, went out on the streets and face down gang members are shooting across the backyard. She said, stop it. These are my people. So one guy pulled a gun on her. She said, go ahead and shoot. I'll just get to heaven faster than I was planning on going. <laughs> Gutsy <laughs> Lots woman. of courage. Uh, what, do you, what do you think are the roots of compassion in America? The roots of compassion in America go back really to our founding. We were founded as a nation of people who came here oftentimes because of their religious convictions, but who also came here independent of the patronage of a government and had to rely on each other. Neighbors took care of each other. Right. It was a very right. normal thing to do that. From this um, dependency on each other grew all kinds of private voluntary associations. And when Alexis de Tocqueville came to the U.S. in the 1830s, he looked around at these flourishing things. They're sprouting up out of the soil everywhere. And he said this was something really remarkable about this, about this country. But he also said that this impulse to give, this caring for one another, defines the American character, but it is also offset with a very strong individualistic, materialistic, self-satisfied, stay-alone kind of tendency. Mm -hmm. And as long as we keep these two in a healthy tension, we'll have a healthy country. But I would suggest now that we are leaning more in this other direction, and to the extent that we can revitalize the roots of compassion, we'll be a healthy nation. That's a very good point. Now, what are, uh, let's say, what are some of the ways to be smartly compassionate? Because some people are taken advantage of when they're, quote unquote, to compassion, what they think is compassion. Sure. There are three ways of being involved. One is at the outer ring, it's three concentric circles. The outer ring is to give things to people, and, and that's good. Mm -hmm. Money, Thanksgiving turkeys, Christmas presents for right. kids who don't have any, that's great stuff. But that's a one-time, drop-it-off kind of thing. The next circle inside is to be compassionate by going to an event where you have a specific day and a thing you're doing that's going to go a little bit deeper. It might be building a Habitat for Humanity house. Mm -hmm. It might be doing a, a rehab or a freshening up for a school and a whole bunch of people come in as volunteers. But that's a one-time kind of a thing. But the sweet spot right in the center is an ongoing relationship. Mm -hmm. And to be truly smartly compassionate, it's that ongoing relationship, a one-on-one, -on -one, like a mentoring relationship, where you show up once a week for an hour for a whole year that changes lives. It changes you as well as the person that you are reaching out to. Now, what are some of the things that you can do to get involved with your community? Let's say you've never done it before, you're a little afraid, it's outside your comfort zone. There are great opportunities to go and be engaged. And I know we've mentioned Kids Hope before, but I am absolutely convinced that mentoring is by far and away the most satisfying and the one where it really matters. See, the thing is this. If people are going to be engaged, they need to do something that actually makes a difference. Handing out sandwiches under a bridge to homeless people is nice, but it doesn't help them stop being homeless. If you can engage with people who are ready to make a transition in their life, either the very youngest among us, like children who can be mentored, or some of the folks who are coming through the working connection. They've already decided mm -hmm. to leave drugs, and they're out of prison. They want to have a changed life. If you come in at either the front end or the back end, where people are really ready to make change, that matters. That's lasting. Mm -hmm. How did all this change you? 
<laughs> completely, completely. I was so much about, I don't know, fame and glory and, you know, going to glamorous places. And I'm finding that I am seeing so much joy in the most unlikely, run-down, you know, held-together-by-duct-tape kind of places. <laughs> Right, I'm finding right. people who are living their convictions, who are living their faith, and they're transforming lives, and I love it. You can feel the love. I can, <laughs> and I hope I give some, too, occasionally, but I know I get a lot more. Now, you wrote um, a book on equipping the saints, um, and it's about philanthropy and making the right choices. Tell me a little bit about that. I think that's very important, to know who to give and how to give. Well, you know, as I got further into this, serving as an advocate for the faith-based groups, I discovered that there were a lot of people who really would like to give, who are philanthropists, who kind of don't know what to do with right. faith-based groups. Everybody says they're doing great work, and it's a little hard to kind of know who are the charlatans and, who, you know, how do you evaluate that? So I wrote a book specifically to be kind of a, an introductory guide to what to look for, um, looking for the integrity of the leadership, looking at the people who are rooted in a neighborhood, who are addressing needs that they know, who have a track record, who have a history with the people that they're mm -hmm. serving. And I found that some of the things that are really kind of common sense apply to this world, but I'd really encourage people to go and see themselves. It's life-changing. I've taken a number of philanthropists into the kind of organizations that are doing some of the, the hands-on work from poorer neighborhoods, and it's life-changing for them, too. They didn't know that that existed. Um, and for those who want to have a guide to go there, I'm willing to do it. A lot of other folks know how to do this, too. But it gives joy. Right, right. Now, in, in that same book, you talk about motivation, that organizations that give need to be motivated. I, w I found that very intriguing. You know, people give for a lot of reasons. Some people give out of a sense of obligation. You know, you chuck a couple bucks in the collection plate. There are people who give because they want recognition and they want their name on the building. I mean, that's fine, and bless them. They've probably given millions of dollars. But the people who give with an idea of genuinely lifting people to their feet are more likely to have a genuine effect. I think our motive needs to be looking at what does it do for this other person? Um, there was a, a rabbi in the 13th century named Moses Maimonides, and he wrote about tzedakah, mm -hmm. the concept, the different levels of giving. And he said the highest level of giving is when you lift a person to their feet, restore them to their dignity, give them what they need to restart. That's the highest form. That's the best way to give. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what do you think is the most important life lesson you've learned from these people? that are out in the streets day in, day out, sometimes with no money, just all heart. There's no place so far that we can fall, that there isn't someone there who's willing to help p pick us up. I found people who are out, who are now dealing with drug addicts, and I know that if I ever encounter an addict, I know places that will lovingly restore them. I discovered people who have ended up in homeless shelters not because they had a totally messed up life, they made two bad decisions and ended up in a place they'd never expected to go. I've discovered that there are compassionate, unsung heroes in all of our cities across America, quietly laboring. That's changed my perspective. We don't hear about them very often. They don't have slick publicity agents. They don't often get to go on television, but they are out there quietly knitting together the raveled fabric of our nation, and they are wonderful folks. Now, when you think of compassion, selfless compassion, who do you think of? I mean, I think of Mother Teresa. I think who of Mother Teresa, of too. Why? And I met her, actually, in 1981. It was remarkable. Um, she was speaking in Washington at the time that I was working for the White House. So I went over to go and hear her speak in the Senate office building. And I'm taken over there in a White House limousine. I'm chauffeured. I'm quite grand getting out of it, thinking I'm just on top <laughs> of the I wish I was part of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw this little, tiny, shriveled nun who stood, you know, up to my she shoulder. She was short, yeah. She's yeah. like four, yeah. And she stood in all of these self-important people who were jostling to get their pictures taken with her. And she simply spoke with simplicity and with moral integrity, with authority that none of us in this self-important political world had. That moved me. That showed me what, <clears throat> what really matters is not what the world values. She was living it, and that made a huge impact. Now, what's next for you after all this? <laughs> 
Right now, I'm in a season of planting. Um, I'm engaging very actively to get more churches willing to form a partnership with a local school through Kids Hope. And That's we great. have a, a strategy in Houston right now to try to engage as many as we can. We have 189 elementary schools right here in Houston. Right now, we have 10 partnerships. Um, 179 to go. So that's a really good, oh, really good thing. A, you're doing an amazing <laughs> job. Just keep doing that. Keep There's going to be another book that. in the future, too, but uh, stay tuned. I'll give you more on that good. as it develops. I can't, I can't wait. I'll I'm in gestation on that right now. Now, how do you know you're living smart? I know that I'm living smart if I am focusing on that which is lasting and which is eternal, not on the things that are fleeting. I know that if I am genuinely living with love, and if I can think about faith, hope, and charity, and remember that love is the best of all, then I'm loving smart. Faith, hope, and love. That's it. Thank you so much, Barbara, for joining us. We Thank really you. appreciate it. And to learn more about this topic, go to our website. There you'll also find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments. And that's our show for today. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a peaceful week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.